You doing good? Good, good, good. All right, why don't you grab a, a copy of God's Word and uh, open it up to Act, Acts chapter, we, I like that song, Acts chapter 2, and we're going to feast on four, uh, verses 42 through 47, and uh, these verses are very familiar to you. If you've been coming to this church for any length of time, you'll probably recognize them as the verses that are on the wall, on the hallway, entering into the sanctuary. Uh, this is some foundational stuff right here. This this is as important as important gets right here. And so um, I want to feast on those words here tonight. And my hope, um, man, I don't know how you feel about it, but I know I'm coming into this room tonight having prayed a certain way. And my, my prayer and uh, I hope the reality come together, and this was my prayer, is that, that, that the word of God would pierce your heart like never before. It would crush your mind like never before. And ultimately, it would impact your will and change the way you live. Okay? Like, big time tonight. I personally think this is as important of a weekend as I've ever been a part of since I've been a Christian. Right here, right now. Okay? So... I hope that it means something to you as well, and I've been praying that God would impact you in a major way. So I hope you have a copy of God's Word in front of you. Don't just listen to me. Um, we started a few weeks ago in this series called To the Ends of the Earth because Jesus Christ said he's going to build his church, and all the powers of hell are not going to stop it, and it's going to come to pass, and, and he wants us to be his faithful witnesses. That means we're going to see and tell what we saw faithfully to the ends of the earth. That means to every single person on the earth. God's desire is that every person would be saved and come to an understanding of the truth. That's a big number. Okay? That's 7 billion right now. And so if you don't think God wants a big church, you need to readjust your thinking. He wants everyone to bow his knee to him. And it's your job. You feel that get heavy? It's your job to reach the ends of the earth. And so um, what God has decided is that he is going to move mightily when all of his people meet together. Now we see that in the scriptures all throughout the book of Acts. They just keep meeting together. And I have to ask you this. Would the story in the book of Acts be true and powerful had Luke deleted the words all met together? And I'll answer it for you. Yes, it would still be awesome because it'd still be things there that we could learn and glean. But for some reason, God inspired Luke to write that they all met together. Now, when you, when you hear a, a stubborn preacher get up every single week, as yours does, and, and, and says, people should come to church, people should come to church, people should come to church, why are the seats all empty, and you get tired of hearing it, I would just want to reference something for you. Hebrews 10.25 says, let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. Okay. More people make a habit of not going to church than going to church. And, and it's not that the pastor gets a check mark for having the biggest show in town. It's because the word of God is clear that when all the believers meet together, God does some powerful stuff to advance his kingdom. And we've, I've asked you this from this pulpit so many times. How many people in the room want to see this place packed out with people who you used to hang out at the bar with, now they come to church with their hands lifted high to heaven, weeping before the Lord, repenting of sin, and serving him. You all want that. And, right? You, let's ask again, who wants that? Everyone does. Everyone does. But the question is, is will you do your part to see that God would do his? He's laid it out before us. And you cannot deny it. It might rub you wrong. I know it's rubbing someone wrong in this room probably right now. And I don't care. Because I didn't write this book. 
And this isn't the church of Moses. I'm nothing but an unworthy servant doing my duty. My job is to be faithful to proclaim what this book says. And I just read to you, do not neglect meeting together, as some people make a habit of doing. That doesn't mean you show up when it's convenient. That doesn't mean you show up when the game's not on. That doesn't mean you show up when your family's not coming in town and you need to pick them up from the airport or whatever other stupid little excuse we want to come up with because I have one every week, but I'm still here. And and, and listen, we have to get past that. Listen, an awesome church is... This is supposed to be my end, but it's the beginning. An awesome church... Listen, loved ones. An awesome church is not filled with people that aren't there. Is anyone getting what I'm saying? Right? A church is not a building. A church, it doesn't matter how comfortable our... Is your seat comfortable? It's pretty comfortable. Not like our old wooden ones, right? Those were nice. (laughs) We kept a couple of those old relics in the back just to remind you of days gone by. But it's not as a matter about the church, how it's laid out, what songs we play, what chairs are comfortable. Right? The church is the people. And the church, if it's to be awesome, it's a, it's a group of, of awesome saints of God that are present, right? Pooling resources and time together, praying our guts out, serving with our sleeves rolled up. That's what makes an awesome church. That's what fills a church. That's what changes a world. Anything short of that, it's not going to happen. And so we could sit here and beat around the bush and beat around the bush, but that doesn't get anywhere. I'd rather tell the truth, and if you decide not to act on it, that's up to you. But I'm not going to go before the Lord and have him say, why didn't you tell him the truth? Not having it. So here we are. Listen, we all meet together. We all meet together. We all meet together. It's all through the book of Acts. It's all right there, okay? And so all the believers meet together up in Jerusalem in this upper room because Jesus said to, and wait there, and the Holy Spirit's going to come and empower you from upon high, and you're going to be filled, and you're going to be my witnesses to the ends of the earth, and everyone's going to find out about me because of you. And so they go to Jerusalem, and, the, and they meet together in the room, and the Holy Spirit, as promised, shows up and drops mad linguistic skills on all the people that are there. And they start speaking all these other languages so that all the people that have converged upon Jerusalem, thousands, by the way, can hear the good news of what God has done. To hear the news about the Savior. You're going to be the witnesses to the end of the earth. Well, how can just this little small group of people impact the world? Well, God brought people to them so they could pass on the good news to them. So they could hear the good news. They could believe on the Savior. And then they could take what they had, right? And then go back to where they came from. And listen, 2 Timothy 2, 2. They will pass on to trustworthy men and women this good news, who will in turn pass it on to others. That's disciple-making. That's the process of of Jesus saying, go teach them to obey all that I've taught you. So the question is, like them there in the upper room, like all those people that converged onto Jerusalem to hear the good news so the good news could get to the other people that don't know it yet. Are you trustworthy? Are you trustworthy? And I would just venture to say that most people are not. And when I say trustworthy, we don't need to go to the dictionary for it because the answer to the Bible is in the Bible. And it says, tell it to trustworthy men and women. Here it is. Who will pass it on to others? That's what a trustworthy person is. If Jesus invests, invests his gospel into you and he's given you this precious, precious thing to manage to take care of for him. What are you going to do with it? Loved ones, what are you doing with this that you've been given? Will you pass it on to others faithfully? Or will you just come when it's convenient and listen? I'm trying my best for 10 years now to pass on what I've learned to trustworthy men and women, but who will pass it on? And that's what we need to do. Are you trustworthy? 1 Corinthians 4.2 tells us, 
more, this is King James, moreover, that means like more importantly than anything else I was talking about right now, Paul says, but more important than the thing before, which we don't need to read that that is, you can read it on your own. Moreover, it is required, how much, um, how much wiggle room is in the word required? None. None. Okay? It is required in a steward. Do you know what a steward is? The trustworthy person who was given something to manage. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm going away on a vacation, Donald, and I need you to watch my house for me. He's a steward of my house, right? It's not his house. Whose house is it? Right? It's mine, but he has to take care of it. So when I get back, it's properly maintained and taken care of, right? And so he's required to, to steward that thing well. So it says right here, moreover, it is required in a steward that one be found faithful. Are you trustworthy? Are you trustworthy? Are you a Christian or are you a trustworthy Christ follower? That's hard. 1 Corinthians 1 9. I think this is going to be a great place for an amen, okay? You ready? Not yet. Listen. God is faithful to do what he says. So that's good, right? That's good. It's good to know that he'll do what he says. Well, I'm not Jesus. Do you ever hear someone say, I do that too? I'm not Jesus. Okay, I get that. But you're required to be found faithful, right? If, if you were Jesus, you'd be required to be found faithful, wouldn't you? So 1 Corinthians 1, 9, God is faithful to do what he says and has invited you into partnership with his son, Christ Jesus the Lord. Yes, so you have to be like Jesus. There, it's not an option for you. A real Christ follower has been invited into partnership with Jesus Christ, the Lord. Right? That little Lord thing, that's in there to tighten the screws on you. If he's your Lord, you're going to do it. If you're not doing it, he ain't your Lord. Okay? That, that's just the way it goes. Okay? And so here's the thing. What, what do you mean by that, preacher? Well, if you were going to start a business with a partner, right, and, and you were selling pulpits, this pulpit, this is, the, this is, our, this is our product, and we've marketed it, and, and we've invested in having it built nicely, and, and I'm, this, I'm a partner, and, and Joe Schmo's a partner over here, and, and listen, if I'm all about this product, and I wake up early, and I hit the road running, and I'm selling, and I'm standing behind it, and I'm talking it up, and I show up early, and I, and I go home late, and I'm all about selling this product. And Joe Schmo is over here doing his thing, you know, making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches when he's supposed to be working and, and going to the dog track and hanging out with his buddies going fishing and shows up every once in a while and pedals off on a pulpit or two. How's that going to work for you? Not working at all, right? Not working at all. How about if you're married and you're, you're totally 100% in on your wife? Like, I love that one. I'm all about her, right? But she's like, yeah, we can hang out once in a while, but I'm going to go hang out with a couple other dudes while I'm at it too. How's that going to work? It ain't happening, right? And, and the scriptures say that God is faithful to do what he says, and he's invited you into partnership with his son, Jesus Christ the Lord. Jesus is pretty faithful to do what he says. The question is, is are you? Are you trustworthy? Are you trustworthy? What does partnership with Jesus Christ look like? Let's just get down in the dirt. What's it look like? Do me a favor. Go to 2 Corinthians. You can keep your finger in Acts. We'll take, we'll take a look at that in a minute. But uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I don't want to jump around too much, but when it's this good, you just can't. You can't, you can't blow it off, okay? So chapter 6, right here, here's Paul, right? He's, he's, he's a partner for Jesus, right? I mean, Jesus was faithful in his ministry. You know, he was whipped, he was beaten, he was killed. He didn't care. That's what he was doing. And what, what about Paul? Same thing. I'm all in, right? All in. Woe to me if I don't preach. So he's a partner, and so he is, he's definitely in a good place to speak of partnering with, with the Lord. Look at it says here, as God's partners. Can't ask for anything better than that. You know, I could sit here and try to come up with a sermon all day long, but when God gives you one, it's just so easy when it just flows like this. We're talking about being partners. Look, 
as God's partners, look what he says, we beg you not to accept this marvelous gift of God's kindness and then ignore it. Now, now, now listen. Some would say, well, that's about salvation right there, okay? Yes, and more. Because what we want to do is we want to reference back to what he was talking about right before that. What is he talking about? What is this marvelous gift of God's kindness? Well, look at verse 17. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ is a new creation. That's awesome, right? If you belong to Christ, you're no longer subject to the penalty that your sin earned you. Praise God, right? That's awesome. And we would all rejoice in that, would we not? But listen, that's not all that it says. That's the, this is the trustworthy part. It's easy to receive that and go, hey, thank you, Jesus. I'm all in on that. But look what it says. This means that if you belong to Christ as a new creation, the old life is gone, a new life has begun. Praise God. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. Whoa, see now, there's more to the gift here. See, it's easy to just accept that wonderful gift. Hey, thanks, Jesus. I appreciate it, Jesus. I'm saved, Jesus. I get to go to heaven, Jesus. But part of the gift is that you get the privilege of sharing that gift with other people. And he gave, look what he says. He said, Christ was doing it, reconciling the world. But then he, but the sin, and you guys understand, Christ went to the cross, went to the grave, right, and then ascends to heaven. And he's the visible image of the invisible God, but now he's gone, so we're the visible image of the invisible Jesus. And so he's, he was the one doing it, but now look, and now he's given us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. So, so that's, that's what being trustworthy is. He's given you the gift of new life, but part of the gift of new life is that you have to, you are required to be faithful to not ignore that thing. You can't say yes to the first half and not yes to the second. You can't say yes to him being Lord, but not Messiah. You can't say yes to Messiah, but not Lord. It's all of it. You can't say yes to salvation and no to sharing it with people. It's a package deal. You can't get around it because that's what God's word says. So are you a trustworthy, faithful partner of Jesus Christ? The question is, let's just make it simple. Will you do your part? Don't easily, don't quickly say yes. Because I've been doing this for 10 years and everyone says yes, but they don't. Don't lie to God. Don't, don't, don't amen and yes when you won't do it. Don't, don't say your will be done, you know, your kingdom come, your will be done if you really won't do what his will says. Don't pray the prayer if you won't do it. Don't say you'll receive it and you'll do it, but then not. We'll get back to that in a second. So Jesus has this church plan, and it's a massive, massive, explosive launch on this Jewish feast called Pentecost, Shavuot. There in Jerusalem, thousands of people are coming. The Holy Spirit drops. Tongues of fire come down. Everyone's speaking in these other tongues so people from foreign lands can hear the gospel in their language, understand it, and then go back. That was an awesome meet together, was it not? And let's check out this other awesome all met together. It's my favorite. I think it's better than the first one, but that's just my opinion and it means nothing. Acts chapter 2 verse 42 says this. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, that's communion, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. 
I noticed something. The awe didn't happen because of the signs and the wonders. The awe came because of Jesus and then resulted in them doing those signs and wonders. You see the placement of the scriptures. Okay. The awe wasn't, oh, look at these guys. They're awesome. No. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miracles. Not because, the, it's because and they did it. Not because they did it. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their, that's not fellowship, that's a bad translation, added to the church those who were being saved. So the context here, what's happened again, is that Pentecost has taken place. The Holy Spirit drops. They're filled. They're speaking in tongues. Everyone gets the message. And, and, but before they go back to their cities, they're still hanging around. And Peter has preached his first message. It's the first message in the history of the church. And listen, he boldly goes out after Jesus is killed and, and he speaks of this Jesus, knowing all the while that if he speaks like this, he could get killed too. And he doesn't care. Talk about sacrifice. And he doesn't care, and he preaches this message, and it's said that his words pierced their heart, cut their heart. And, and the people were like, undone, and like, what do we do? What do we do? And listen, the gospel requires a response. Jesus requires a response. He requires response. The guy led me to the Lord. He brought me to tears. He said, you cannot leave Jesus on the fence and just part-time him. If he's Lord, you better do what he says. And I started crying, and he's right. He's right. And Peter, and Peter preaches, and like, what do we do? And he says, you need to repent of your sin, turn to God, be baptized in the name of Jesus. And listen, 3,000 people got saved right then and there. 3,000 people right then and there. This is the context of what, what's happening here. This is what's happening. So yeah, there's awe because Jesus Christ, the, the, the Son of God, the, the second person of the Trinity, comes down and does all this insane, amazing stuff and then he rises from the grave under his own power. No one, no one cast any spells or threw any power at him. On his own, he raises from the dead and they see him and they talk to him and they eat with him. Whoa! Mind blow. So that's why they do this. And maybe that's why we can't get people to even go to church to meet because there's no awe. Maybe it's just because that's all we do is part-time him. Maybe it's all we do is, is, is study his word because we want to understand what it says. Instead of being in awe of who he is, we want to make sure we're hermeneutically correct and have the best systematic theology. Who cares about that stuff? How about some awe of the one who spoke the planets into existence? Can you do that? Maybe that's what we need. And so... They all meet together in response to this awe that they had of Jesus Christ. Listen, four all togethers, four alls mentioned in six verses. Why? 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 Again, did he have to really mention that? No. Still could have been awesome. The story could have continued. Maybe some of them met. Maybe a bunch of them met. That would have been all right. Still would have been worth preaching, but that's not what it says. There's a reason why God puts it in the book. Why? He's making a point, y'all. Four times in six verses. There must be something to it. Maybe that's why the writer of Hebrews said, don't neglect coming together. Maybe that's why he's saying, blow off your other crap and make me important. Because I want to do something awesome in your life if you give me a chance. Give me something, give me a, a tank to fill with oil. Give me a pocket, give me a hand that's open so I can bless you. Show up. Maybe that's why the author says that. He wants people to all meet together. The church is an all-together thing. It's not a when you want to, you show up once in a while and, and, and you throw your 
few bucks in when you decide to show up. Listen, I was talking to Nick about this earlier. Conviction time, like here I am, I'm gonna, you'll probably hate me again. Listen, I, I don't listen to, I don't, I don't know who gives what. Like I don't do the money here, okay? I don't. But I'm not stupid. I'm sitting here when the offering plate goes around. This is, this is hard, but listen to me. People decide not to show up to church because they have other stuff to do for real. Other stuff. Other stuff. And I don't want you to raise your hand, but how many people, because I've asked around, I know, that, I know the answer to it. How many people make up their offering when they come from the weeks they didn't? Hardly ever. You know why? Because in America, you pay for your entertainment. That's why. How does the church grow based on your unfaithfulness, folks? I, listen, you, you could rip me, but I watch it. I've been watching this for 10 years. Last week, there was about this many people here on Saturday night. Do you know who's in the offering plate on Saturday night? The whole offering. Two dollars. Two dollars. Forget the practicals of, of keeping the place open, but is, is that the faithfulness of God's people that he's going to bless? I guarantee we spent more than $2 on other stuff, but we won't spend it where it matters. I'm just using it as an example. Like it's, There's such unfaithfulness in the body of Christ. How can he do what he wants to do if you won't do what he said to do. I mean, I don't know how much clearer to make it. And I know there's people in this room right now who are, pardon me, so pissed at me right now for telling you the truth. Because they don't want to hear it. People don't want to hear this. But it's true. It's true. So they all met together. They all met together. Three places were mentioned there. What does it say? Let's, let's, let's look here. All the believers met together one place. It doesn't say where that place is. It just says they met together in one place. Well, we know it's not the temple because the temple is mentioned later. It says, and they worshiped in the, together at the temple. And they met in homes. So they met. There was like some place. It talked about there was this place where they shared everything they had. And then they sold their property and, and possessions and then brought the money to like this gathering place, you know, like the community coffee house or something, right? They're like a coffee house. Maybe they had a coffee house down there. And they, they, they hung out, right? And this, one, this one's attached to the building, so it's not really. But you know what I'm saying? Maybe there's just a place that they used to meet. And then it says that they met in the temple every single day. You know the average churchgoer in, 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 that, that's a member of a church goes twice a month. you love church, you go on Sunday. If you love the Bible, you go on Wednesday. If you love God, you go on Monday. <clears throat> they met in the temple every single day. I guess one of the big struggles I have, and maybe I don't know if I'm crazy or not. Well, no, I, we all know I'm crazy. <laughs> but <laughs> that was not the intention of that part of the sermon. But thank you. But the, thing, I, the thing that frustrates me, Probably more than anything. I, I'm a church guy. Obviously, that's what I'm doing, right? But the early church, they met every day. Do you think they had jobs? Kids, car, I mean, stuff? You think. But somehow they found that it was important enough to do it. You know, they met. Some people think, well, church is supposed to be, you know, um, small groups and homes. That's what we're supposed to do. I agree. But not all, only, not only. And it's supposed to be, some people love the big box, like the big room and, and church services and everyone's worshiping and getting after it. Yes, but not just that. Some people think, you know, we don't need to have all this stuff. We don't have to pay rent on this and, 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 and have to t clean it and take care of all these things and programs and stuff. And we should just have Bible studies at the lake and at work and at the this and at the that. Yeah, I, I agree. All three of them are present right there. They met in one place. It was a place that was not a house of worship. They met there. They just hung out. And then they met in the temple. And then they met in homes. My home, your home. This is what they did. 
And as I preach this stuff, I know from input from people that that, that, that stuff, that's for the fanatic, man. That's for the fanatic to meet every day and put the, the church gathering of the saints and pooling resources. You see it there. I'm, so when I talk about offering, I mean, it's, it's not like I didn't see it, right? They sold all their stuff, gave their money to the apostles so that nobody had any needs. Like, that's what they did. And, and I see that, and we just make excuses for not doing it. And the thing that frustrates me is I see all this, and people think, well, that's just a fanatic. Those are for the fanatics. But when you look at the text, what does it say? All of them. It wasn't for the fanatic. It was for, so listen, let me, let, let's, let's redefine fanatic. Fanatic equals Christian. Christian equals fanatic, right? All the believers, right? All the believers. Now, now listen. For all those people that think that big churches are bad, there was 3,000 3, people in this. 3,000. And every day growing more. So what does this teach me? I don't know if it teaches you, but I teach, what I'm taught is church everywhere. Church everywhere. There's not a place on earth that isn't appropriate for you to gather and share the good news of Jesus with people, believers and non-believers alike, everywhere. It's supposed to permeate the world. That's what the ends of the earth means. We gotta stop, we gotta get away from the Christian rhetoric and make it a reality. Okay? That's what we need to do. So, what are these people, what are these fanatics, all of them? What did they do together? Well, you see it there in the text, not making anything up. They were devoted to four things. When they were together, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. What is the apostles' teaching? Hold it up. Right here. What is the apostles' teaching? Is it all of the apostles' teaching? No. But, but this is the part of the apostles' teaching that God saw fit to get to you. So let's at least be devoted to that. Can we do that? They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They were devoted to the fellowship. We're going to see a little bit more about that, but we, we already touched on that. What's that? Faithful partnership. That's what, that's what fellowship is. Faithful partners. Uh, they were devoted to sharing in meals, and that included communion, and they were devoted to prayer. I love the word devoted. I love the definition of it more. It means given over. Given over, listen, to study, to discussion, and display. That's awesome. They were devoted to studying the Word of God. They were devoted to, to, to study what real Christian fellowship was. They were there to discuss the workings of the church how are we going to push the mission? And then they were devoted to displaying it. That means what? Doing it, right? They're devoted to these things. They were given over to it. It's like, wait, what do you guys do? This is what we do. You don't watch football game? No. No, we don't do that. You don't go to the park? No. What do you do? We're give, this is what we do. We, 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 we're devoted to the apostles' teaching, praying, breaking bread, doing communion, and discussing how we could advance this thing more. That's what we're committed to. What, what, about, what about Saturday? No, no. This is what, we, what about Friday? No. This is what we do. This is what we do. Um, so let's just pick those four apart, can we? What does it look like to be devoted to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to sharing in meals, communion, and prayer? Okay, so the first one, uh, devoted to the apostles' teachings. Okay, devoted to the apostles' teaching. What is devoted look like? What is given over to the apostles' teaching look like for us, right? I would just say this. Um, if you're devoted, given over to studying it and discussing it, I would say, I would use the word frequency, not as in AM, FM, radio, as in often, right? If you're devoted to something, husbands and wives, how, okay, can you be devoted on Monday and Tuesday, but not to be devoted for the rest of the week? Where does that get you? Divorced. Right? So, so, so devoted to, to the study and the discussion and the meditating on and the learning from it. When's that going to happen? All the time. 
frequency, right? And then given over to study, discussion, and display. So devoted would look like I, I study it frequently. That's, I would just venture to say that's just, you're going to see in a second what it really means. And then the second thing is obedience, right? That's display. I've studied it. I know what it says. I've meditated on it. I've discussed it with my brothers and sisters. What does this mean for our church? And then what? We display it. We do it. That's devotion to the word of God, to the apostles' teachings. So, so the word of God is put, this, now again, this is kingdom building, ends of the earth, right? This is, what, this is how God builds the kingdom to the ends of the earth. So, so the, being devoted to the apostles' teaching would take on two forms. Um, wherever Jesus reigns, uh, there his kingdom is, right? So, so Psalm 119.11 would say, I've written your word on my heart so I will not sin against God. So, so I, I study it all the time and I reason it out and I figure out what it says. Why? To grow the kingdom in me. To change who I am. To change how I think. To change my perspective. To change my priorities. So I won't sin against God so I can live that righteous, holy, and pure life that God, that, that God honors and blesses. So that's the kingdom work in me. But that's 2 Timothy 3.16. Every word of this is inspired by God and is useful to teach us. And God uses this to equip all his people for every good work. So the word of God changes you on the inside so you won't sin and prepares you to advance the kingdom through you to the outside. And that doesn't happen if you read the Bible because it's on the screen on the weekend. Frequent, continuous study of God's word changes who you are and prepares you and equips you to put you in those situations where you can open your mouth and share the gospel so people's lives can be transformed and his kingdom can grow. And there's no way around that. There's no way around that. Joshua 1, study the word continually. That's not a suggestion. I just, just, some people are encouraged by hearing all this because they're doing it, and I know that you are. This is not a universal, broad brush devastation of the church. Some of you will hear it and be encouraged. Some of you need to be corrected. Some of you need to be rebuked because you're completely off the mark. That's what the word of God does. And I just, I don't know how to proclaim it in a different way to inspire you to radical obedience when it says to study it continually. Just do that. I'm not a fancy orator. I don't know how to manipulate the scene and the mood and the room and the words to make you do it. It's obedience. Psalm 1 says to delight and meditate on the word day and night. So not only is it a command, but listen, there's benefit for you. So if you want to just shift off of obedience from the Lord, which is the, mo the big reason why you should do it, but if you want to be self-centered, and I am too, listen, if we'll delight and meditate on God's word day and night, if it's the thing that's on your mind, you're devoted to it, right? If you're devoted to it, look what happens. If you're that person, then you're like a tree planted by the river, right? Just think weeping willow. I, I, I think of the one right next to Tavares by the lake. It's always just so healthy, right? Full of leaves. It's planted by the river, it says, drawing up nutrients every season, bearing fruit in every season, and its leaves never wither. Its leaves never wither. It's bearing fruit in every season. That means that there's fruit being produced in me. I'm changing. I'm growing. I'm increasing. I'm, I'm, I'm more knowledgeable. I'm more filled with wisdom. I'm more filled with, with faith. Right? I can trust him more. I know the word of God more. I could share with other people more because I've written it on my heart. I'm living more holy, more pure, more righteous. I'm living in a way that honors him. It's changing me. My life's always bearing fruit. And through me, 
Through me, I'm bearing fruit for the kingdom. I'm leading this guy to the Lord, and I'm leading that lady to the Lord. I'm led him to the Lord, and the kingdom is growing because a growing kingdom is a, is a, the growing population is a, is a king's glory. So, so, so he says, if you'll, right, devoted to the apostles' teachings, that means frequently we're reading it, we're studying it, we're meditating on it all the time. And if you'll do that, it's no wonder why God was adding to the church every day. You think he was adding to the church every day because some guy was walking down the road to Kmart and went, "Woo, Holy Spirit, boom, I'm going to that church. No. Someone opened their face and said something, right? And led them to the Lord and told them just like Peter did. The, the, how many people do you think would have got saved that day during Peter's message if he never spoke? Right? Point. Okay. So devoted to the apostles' teaching. Devoted to fellowship. That's the next thing. Our reductionist attitude in America, we reduce things down for simplistic reasons. And so, you know what fellowship is? Hey, I, you know, I really enjoyed our fellowship today. Why? Because we sat around and watched the Red Sox game together? Oh, oh but, but we're Christians, so we didn't cuss. That's not fellowship. Right? Fellowship is not Christians hanging out together. Fellowship isn't go down into the fellowship hall to drink punch and, and, and apple fritters after the, although apple, let me, refract, let me rephrase that. <laughs> apple fritters might be part of that. Herb, I love you. Jen, I love you. Just don't quit bringing them on Monday, okay? But, 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 but no, listen, that's what it is, right? Uh, oh, let's, let's hang out. Let's have some fellowship together. Listen, you know what fellowship is? Fellow, the only time it's fellowship is if we get together and talk about the Lord and what the Lord's doing and how we can partner with him to do it greater. That's fellowship. Anything short of that, that's just hanging out. And listen, we can hang out. It's just that, listen, guess what? They didn't. There was no idle talk. You know the Bible says you have to give every, you have to give an account for every idle word that ever came out of your mouth? High bar. <clears throat> fellowship is when you partner with Jesus to accomplish his mission to reach the ends of the earth. Nothing less. It's the Greek word koinonia. It does mean fellowship, but it means partnership. It's being partners with Jesus. That's why Paul was saying earlier, as God's partners, you don't just receive the gift, right? That puts you in the club. I get it. But then you also have to, you can't ignore it. You've got to go give it, right? That's partnership. That's partnership. Accepting Jesus, that's a gift of God. Receiving it with joy, for sure, but don't stop there. That's just the kingdom in me, but ignoring is wrong. Not ignoring it, but sharing the good news with others. That grows the kingdom population. That's fellowship. That's fellowship, okay? Um, I was told I don't preach grace enough, bless you. And I'm too harsh. Being saved and getting to partnership with Jesus to tell people about him is an amazing grace. It's an amazing grace of God. Just imagine this grace for just a second. A sinner by birth hell-bent on rebellion against a holy God. And this same God has now forgiven you for all that rebellion and then gives you, you, the privilege of speaking for him in this epic battle of good against evil for the souls of the human race. That's grace. No one deserves this privilege. In fellowship, that's the practical application of spreading Christ's kingdom to the ends of the earth. It's the partnering in the endeavor, not just the receiving of the salvation. 
It's the partnering in the endeavor that others would receive the same salvation that you didn't deserve. And so you pass it on to them. It's the redeemed people of God deciding in their will and saying, yeah, Jesus, I'm in on doing whatever it takes to reach the world. I'm rolling up my sleeves. I'm doing my part. Let's do this thing. Let's get the, let's get the gospel to everyone. Let's build the kingdom of God. That's fellowship. Do me a favor and, and turn to the book of Philippians real quick. Look at Philippians chapter 1, uh, 3 through 6. Paul's a great pastor, and, I, and I'm trying to learn from him, and I, I'm not there yet, but I'm, 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 I think I'm better than I was by the grace of God. Look what he says. You guys there? Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make my requests for all of you with joy. For you have been my partners, right? So, so, they're, so they're saved, but, but right? So yeah, they're, we're partners, but look what he says. Look what partnering is. You've been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ. Right? And I love this. Not only you, uh, are you partners, partnership means spreading the word. That means rolling up your sleeves, getting to work, serving like crazy, giving like crazy, praying like crazy, attending like crazy, and opening your mouth like crazy. Like crazy, right? Because that's what Paul did. So it, 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 look, listen, partnership, we talked about the marriage and the business earlier, right? Equally yoked. We're both doing the same thing. That's how a business works. That's how a marriage works, right? And the same thing here. He's like, listen, you're my partners in spreading the good news about Christ. And watch this. I love this. From the time you first heard it until now. There's no waiting. Well, I got to learn first. Got to go to seminary. Got to go to church for a little while. No, 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 no. From the moment you heard it, you were getting after that thing. And you wonder, listen, loved ones, why was the church spreading so rapidly? Because everyone was waiting to get their seminary degree? No. The reason why it was spreading so rapidly is because from the moment they said yes to Jesus, they said yes to opening their mouth to the world. That's why. I mean, I'm not, I'm not making up. I mean, you read it. it you read it. And, and, and so you, you have to understand it's not just from the time you first heard it until now. So what does that mean? Faithful, nonstop, all the time, frequent, constant, open your mouth, open your mouth, roll up your sleeves, get to work, massive sacrifice every day. This is what we do. You want to go fishing? I can't. I'm preaching. The world don't want to hear this, guys. I get it. That's what it says. Now look here. I think this, is a, a, this next verse is one of the most... Um, well, it's a verse that I think is taught very, very wrong. I'll give you my perspective. You can do what you want with it. You've been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard until now. And I am certain that God, who began the good work in you, and I don't like that within, because that's not the real word in the other translations that are older and more word for word. It's in you. I'm sure that that God, who began the good work in you, will continue his work until it is finally finished in the day when Christ Jesus returns. So what is always taught is that, hey, listen, he, he, he came to the Lord, and he's kind of walked away and turned, turned from the Lord. But don't worry, because the one who began the good work, who got him saved back in the day, is going to make sure that he gets back to Jesus before he dies. Don't worry about it. The one who began the good work will continue to do so to the day of Christ Jesus. That's not what it is. Is that true? Well, I don't know. See, the context of what this is written in is, is this spreading of the gospel. Don't neglect the context of what is written here. He's talking about them spreading the good news of, the, of Jesus Christ. And I'm convinced that God's going to continue to use you for that. The reason why I know that he's saying this, one, contextually, and two, if you go down to the uh, two more paragraphs, then he starts talking about what's going on inside of you. Then he starts going about, about what's going on inside of you. Look at verse 9. I pray that your love will overflow more and more 
and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. For I want you to understand what really matters so you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with, joy, with, filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Christ. This will bring much glory and praise to God. You see the work that God's doing in you there? So the verse above it is not about what he's doing in you. It's what he's doing through you. What he started in the Philippian church of these people partnering with Paul to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth, he's going to continue to do that. And somehow it worked out because it's here now in Leesburg 2,000 years later. Working diligently in partnership with Jesus. Not so much with Paul anymore because he's dead, but you know what I mean? And with each other to push the kingdom of Christ to the ends of the earth. Listen, I'm devoted to this. I am devoted to this. I am given over to this. Are you? That's what makes a church awesome. I don't make it awesome. The songs we sing don't make it awesome. The chairs you're sitting in don't make it awesome. The location and the time of service don't make it awesome. What makes it awesome is if you are given over to this. That's what makes it awesome. And so I'm offering you that. I'm asking you to make a decision whether you're given over to the fellowship, to the partnership with Jesus to reach the ends of the earth. Here's the third thing. Devoted to the apostles' teaching, devoted to the fellowship, devoted to meals and communion. Look at verse 46 of Acts chapter 2. What does it say? They worship together at the temple each day met in homes for the Lord's Supper. That's communion. I guess for the Catholic friends out there, it's the Eucharist. All the same thing, right? Wafers, crackers, wine, juice. You know what I'm talking about? If you don't, I'll let you know after we're done. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of God. What people? All the people. All the people. And just to throw this in there again, just to whet your appetite for what could be, and each day the Lord added to their church those who were being saved. So they met in homes for communion, and they shared meals. They opened up their home and, and they, they did it, what, with great joy. It wasn't like a, oh, I got to do that. I don't want to have people over. They inc it's inconvenient, and, and I got, it's a school night. This is a new. They shared their homes, their meals with joy and generosity. They gave, they, what did they do? They gave their best meal. Their best meal was reserved for the church. And all the while, while they were doing it, they weren't complaining or finding excuses not to do it. What were they doing? They were praising God and enjoying the people. Okay, so I'm about to tighten the screws. Paul said in, 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 to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, I mentioned to you before, that the word of God, he told him to patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. Right? So when you hear the word of God, some people are going to be encouraged. Hey, I'm, 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 I'm rocking that thing. Awesome. Attaboy, girl. Some people just kind of got off course. Like they open up their house, but they don't do it with joy. <clears throat> and some people are going to be rebuked because they don't do any of this. And those are the ones that are probably sitting here going, I've heard enough of you, Moses. But here's some good teaching that I've been patiently teaching this church to the tune of a year and a half with epic failure. They met in homes daily to 
study the apostles' teaching, pray, talk about the fellowship, partnering, and breaking bread and taking communion. That's what it says, right? And for a year and a half, we got up here. And said, why don't you guys start some rev groups? Meet in homes. And on an average, our church is between 60 Saturday and Sunday and 75, 80 people. And other than myself and my wife, Mimi was the only person who would open up her home. Everyone's too busy. It's too inconvenient. Got my own thing going. Why do we do it? Why am I doing, why am I saying this? To make you feel guilty? No. It's because God uses in-home groups to build his kingdom. That's why. And so when we get up here and make an announcement, hey, you want to do that? We even, we even put together a folder that had, you didn't have to even learn how to do anything. Just open it up and read it and, 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 and we'll show you what to do. Like you don't have to do anything. And no one, no one, said yeah. And they met for communion. And the other thing that we do almost every single week is talk about our Monday night prayer group where we take communion every single Monday night. So the question I have for you, because, and, and listen, again, this is, sounds like a hammer. I'm tightening the screws because I'm your pastor. I want you to roam in the greenest pastures, man. I want you to. I want you to roam in the greenest pastures so your faith can be flourishing and our church can flourish and our community can be blessed because of it. And we can't get there without this. So, so when we get up and talk about communion, I know that out of 75, 80 people on a weekend, you get like 10, 12 people that show up for communion. Other stuff's more important. I mean, I'm done. I know it sounds like I'm being a jerk. I get it. I, I, I wouldn't want to hear this either, but I mean, it says they were, they were devoted to this. Are you, are you devoted? Like the thing that concerns me as your pastor is not so much the fact that you're not taking the communion and what could happen while you're taking it, the connection you'd have with the Lord in the communion time. What, what hurts me is that there doesn't seem to be any given over to going, like putting aside other stuff. Hey, we're taking communion Monday night. Oh, heck yeah, I'm going to be there. What's more important? Are you given over to this? Are you devoted to having people over? Are you devoted to partaking in the Lord's table? Are you meeting in homes to build up faith and relationship with people in your church? No, we are not doing that. And we get up here every week and try to preach inspiration and preach growth into the body of Christ. And preaching won't do that. Doing it does that. Right? Anybody enjoying this? No, I get it. But it's true. James said, don't be hearers and deceive yourself. Be doers. The kingdom grows when we do as the king says, period. And that's it. <clears throat> Gathering together for meals and taking communion together are massive, massive, heavy elements in a healthy, vibrant life-giving, life-transforming church that actually impacts the community that God planted it in. And you can't impact the community without doing it. It's not going to happen. <laughs> and again, the result of this type of devotion was what? Your dream. Your dream that he added to the church all your old drinking buddies. Right? That's what we want. We all want it. 
but I don't know if we'll do what is needed for the Lord to save and add in this way. See, the Lord, the Lord does this. He does it through us. We, 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 hear, we hear the gospel and we accept the gospel and then we, with sleeves rolled up, we partner with Jesus to reach everyone with the gospel. That means we should be, listen, serving like crazy, giving like crazy, inviting like crazy. We have these, here, here's the thing that's, it, it, here we go. This is the new me, so if you don't like it, I'm sorry. There's, thing, there, there's, there's a program, this is what's so sad. There's a program that someone who doesn't come to the church anymore, he bought it for our church. So we could spend a bunch of money on this. And it was a, it had great intentions. It was an invite one. And, and it would have been a, a very pricey endeavor. And it's to teach all of us how to do that and, and to put up some marketing flags and, and invitations that you could give. Like, here, you take 10 and you take 10. And, and we give like, all that to get a member of a church to invite one person. How pathetic is that? Come on. <laughs> this is the frustration. If I'm frustrated, <laughs> loved ones, what's the guy who's on your shirt thinking? I got to pay you guys to invite someone to meet me? Come on, y'all. Is the last one is devoted to prayer. Devoted to prayer. I, we could talk about a lot of different things, but I don't think that anyone could deny the fact that prayer is like the engine that drives the church. It's the way you stay connected. You can study the Bible, and I, that, I, that's my thing. You know that's my thing, it's studying the Bible. So I'm like all about studying the Bible. But, but, but prayer is where you get a little bit of that awe. You might not get as much. You, you need to understand who he is. That's what this is. But, but a lot of the awe and that connection is in prayer, right? When all of a sudden, like, this thing you can't see starts talking to you, that's awe, right? So, so prayer is, like, super, super important. It drives the church. It's, what, it's our lifeline to, to heaven is prayer. And and. Listen to this, Isaiah 56, 7, Matthew 21, 13, and Mark eleven seventeen. 17, they all say the same thing. When we all meet together, he says, my house, this place where you do meet all together right here, my place that where you meet all together, it's a house of prayer. It's a house of prayer. Like, there's lots of stuff that we can do when we get together. But one of them should be so paramount, so often, so much, so important, that it actually names the place. It's a house of prayer. Is it a spirit-filled church? Is it an evangelistic outreach church? Is it a charismatic church? Is it a Bible church? Is it a Baptist church? It's a praying church. That's what it's supposed to be, a praying church. So, so how come it should be a house of prayer? Like, okay, so God says it should be a house of prayer. Like, like that's, I mean, that's, that's a, I mean, just pray? Like, that's, a, how can we pull, how, how are we going to do that? I run out of stuff. I, I don't know about you, but I pray, I'm four minutes in, I'm like singing Def Leppard songs. <laughs> I don't know what to pray about. Listen. Why would we be marked as a house? Of, why would prayer mark who we are? How about this? 1 Timothy 2.1, I urge you, first of all, that's kind of a priority statement, right? Timothy, my young protege, um, I want you to have evangelism training, feed the homeless, open up an orphanage, open up a Christian private school, all those things, right? But, he didn't say that really, but I urge you, first of all, pray for all people. Pray for all people. If you read that section in 1 Timothy 2, it's also people in authority. we got a problem with that. 
In our country, we got a massive problem with that because we think Democrat and Republican is more important than Jesus. So we need to get over our little discrepancies, leave them in your living room at, the, at CNN, okay, and pray for your president. I don't care if you hate him. It doesn't matter if you hate him. I think he's a total boob. It doesn't make any difference. The guy's a moron sometimes. I get it. He's our president. Right? The Bible says no one gets into authority unless God puts them there. So, so we, could, we have all this stuff on Facebook, and he's God's person. No, he's not God's person because he says grab girls. It doesn't make any difference what he said. The Bible says that no one's in authority unless God puts them there, and he said to pray for people in authority. So get over yourself and your political affiliation and pray for the president. That's what we're supposed to do. Okay? So I just lost all the Democrats in the church. I'm great at emptying the place. So it says you're supposed to pray for all people, right? Well, that might take a while. We get started tonight, we might finish never. How about Philippians 4, 6? Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Oh, golly. I pray for all people, and i got to pray for every single thing? That might take a bit. Starting to understand the whole house of prayer thing. How about this? 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Never stop praying. Oh, this might last for a long time. In reality, I, I, I think it's probably, and again, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But I'm just throwing this out there. I think it's probably just indicating consistent, ongoing, lifelong practice. Not in every second thing because you've got to sleep. Right? You gotta sleep, you gotta sleep. Right? So he's not gonna tell you to pray without ceasing and then accuse you of falling asleep because he made you fall asleep. He laid you down at Green Pastors. <laughs> all people, all things, all the time. <laughs> eBay. But with all this on the table, right? Do you understand the importance at least of why we say get here on Monday night to pray? At least for starters? Right? For starters, would you come on one day, one hour? Listen, pray for all people, pray for everything, and pray without ceasing. And that's all we're asking is to get this thing jump-started, to prime the pump, to become a house of prayer. Would you just all meet together on Monday night, make it a prayer, and be obedient to the Lord? That's all. So instead of having to get up and poor Karen, bless her heart, she gets up here and begs you to death to come on a Monday night, and you don't. So now I'm calling you into the lordship of Jesus. Forget Karen for a second. He said to all meet together and be a house of prayer. So I want you to be here Monday night, and if you're not, I hope you feel guilty. Really? When Paul wrote the first letter to the Corinthians, he ripped him a new one. And then he got done. He said, yeah, I felt bad at first, but now I don't. Because godly sorrow that leads to repentance is good. If you feel like poop for a little while about not showing up on Monday, good. Maybe you'll show up next week. That's what it says, though, right? So he says, do it. Well, prayer's not that important. Joshua prayed, and the sun stood still. Elijah prayed. It says in the book of James that Elijah was a man just like you and me. Nothing special, just an everyday Joe from Home Depot, right? Elijah prayed for drought and no rain, three and a half years. And he's like, okay, that's enough. Goes outside, rain, boom, done. In Acts chapter 4, the disciples all did what I'm telling you we should do on Monday night. They all got together. They prayed. The Holy Spirit sh showed up and shook the building. He had already showed up to those same exact people in Acts chapter 2. He didn't need to show up again like that. They already had the Holy Spirit. Those same believers are in Acts chapter 4. Those same believers that were already filled with the Holy Spirit, he showed up again. Why? Because they needed to be filled? No, because they prayed. Because they all got together and prayed, and they needed to be empowered to preach boldly. That's what it says. And it shook the building, and it empowered all the people that were there. 
Guess who didn't get empowered to preach boldly? The people who weren't there. Amen. All the people showed up. They all gathered. They all prayed. And all the people were empowered. And man, does the church ever need that. <clears throat> Let's land this plane. And each day the Lord added to the church those who were being saved. So what we see here is every day the Lord Jesus was fulfilling his promise to build his church through his faithful, trustworthy witnesses who were all, listen, all of them, all were devoted to meeting together daily, to study God's word, to sharing in meals, partaking in communion praying and then rolling up their sleeves and getting to work pushing the good news of Jesus to the ends of the earth. And so loved ones, the question is this. All of that to say, are you trustworthy? Are you trustworthy? Listen, the future of the church that God has called you to rests on your shoulders. God will save them but you gotta, you gotta speak, you gotta invite them, you have to serve them, you have to gather here, you have to pray here, you have to give here, all those things that we're supposed to be devoted to doing all together, meeting regularly, all the time. That's what God will bless. Nothing less, nothing less. Don't neglect the meeting together as some people do. Again, I just want to say that great churches are not filled with people who don't show up and don't sacrifice. Great churches have people who are present. Okay? It doesn't make any difference how beautiful this facility is or what songs are played. If people come and they don't meet you and you don't encourage them and you don't serve them and you don't give so we can reach them, it's not going to happen. Ever. And I'm telling you, as the, well, I'm not the only one who's been here since day one, but, but being the person who's been here since day one, this has been our biggest problem right here. Lack of commitment, lack of faithfulness, lack of devotion. There are some in this church, and I commend you. You've been amazing, committed church family members. And be encouraged. But the vast majority of the people, that's not the case. Great churches are filled with people who are devoted in these four ways to reaching the ends of the earth with the gospel. Okay? I want to pray with you. God, like I said earlier, I been my desire that that your word would pierce the hearts of whoever would decide to come here tonight and just pierce their heart pierce their mind and ultimately do something to our will it is not your desire that a single would perish. And it is your desire that all are saved and come to an understanding of the truth. God, it's on the faithful witness, the faithful serving, the faithful giving, the faithful praying, the faithful gathering, the faithful speakers, the one who opens their mouth. How will they know unless they're told? It's these people, these faithful witnesses those that are devoted to this work, given over 
to your work. That's the church that you will use to reach the ends of the earth. God, it is my prayer that this church will be that church. I can't do that work, Lord. Your word has been spoken. Your spirit is here. We're here. And now we have to respond. And so, loved ones, I want you to pray and I want you to ask the Lord what giving to that type of work. What does devotion to Jesus look like? What does it look like to be devoted to reaching people with the gospel? And loved ones, that's how I want you to give. So pray. Take a few moments. Ask him what to do. And then I believe there'll be a couple of young men go through the room with a basket. You can give that way. There's boxes on the back wall. You can give. You can show your devotion that way. You can do it online, whatever. I'm going to be quiet and let you talk to the Lord and figure that out.